Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to have you guys here. Thank you. Such a great, I, I don't know that I can remember with the size of an alpha that we have now, which is about 130, to have this many of you at the weekend. So thank you guys very much for being here. I, I know you're missing your favorite cartoons this morning, so I hope you recorded those. Um, but uh, we just want to do, do welcome you watching, you guys watching online. Uh, this is uh, the Alpha Weekend, and we just love doing the Alpha Weekend. And I, I wrote, if you just take your, uh, your, your little booklet that we gave you, now strangely enough, we're actually going to follow this. I know this is strange, but we're going to follow the booklet uh, pretty closely. Now, I wanted you to read with me here just something, something I wrote that I, even though I wrote it, I still have to wear my glasses to see it. Um, now, think about this with me. I know it's kind of a brain twister early on a Saturday morning. Every comfort zone. Now, you know what a comfort zone is, huh? It's a place where you just feel comfy, right? Every comfort zone is a former discomfort zone awaiting a new discomfort zone that will soon become another comfort zone. Did you get that? Yeah. <laughs> Do we need to read that again? Okay. All of life is about going from being comfortable to uncomfortable. Okay. You're very comfortable in your mother's womb. You don't remember that. Then there's the discomfort and you start crying. Right. And then we go from diapers to <laughs> pull up. Increasing stages of life from elementary to middle to high school to college to new job to n new new job. All of life is a, from single to married to unfortunately maybe single again, but to from areas where we get comfortable and then things happen in discomfort. And what you guys have done, what, what I have done in my life, particularly as it deals with spiritual things, look, you can be very comfortable going to church and reciting the creeds and bowing and praying. You can get very comfortable with that. I can get very comfortable with that. And there's nothing supernatural attached to it. God is supernatural. The fact that you have come here, can, can I just say this to you this morning? And I was reminded about this. Uh, in, our, in our time this morning before we got together. The fact that you are here this morning, and you may be wondering why in the world am I here this morning, <clears throat> is that I think as, as we talked about, I'm going to get so far behind because I didn't plan to sell this. Because as we talked about, okay, this is what's happening in your life. God is saying, it's time to go from comfortable to uncomfortable so that I can bring you, I, I can bring you to a new level of comfort and that you will then desire more discomfort. It happens all through life, whether it's natural, but we're talking about a work of a supernatural God that he wants to do inside of us. But we're so used to, to judging by what our eyes see and by what our ears hear that the thought of a supernatural and inner work of God's spirit in us is strange. But I can just tell you, as that's taken place in my life and folks here, that it's taken place in their life, you begin to welcome the uncomfortable because you know it's a deeper level of getting to know the God who knows us and desires for us to know him at deeper and deeper levels levels. Now, one area of discomfort is an area of singing in public. Um, unless, of course, us men, we enjoy singing in public when we're drunk at a bar. That's when we really get into singing. Uh, but a mode of prayer is singing. We're just praying in song. We're speaking to God in song. And so I have asked this dear friend, Steve Kelly, to lead us in a song. So we're going to put the words up here. Don't worry about singing. Let the words 
penetrate your heart. Okay, let, let me just show you real quick this. Oh, uh, let me do this back up. Hey, if you're watching live stream, we can get you a digital booklet. So just go into the chat room and let us do that. Okay. So here's, here's, the, here's the first words of this song, Your Grace. Your grace, remember, unmerited favor. It opens the way. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way that I might draw near to you with my heart full of faith. Your grace is all undeserved. Though there are times I fail, many more than I know, still you are with me. Here's the chorus. Your amazing grace is perfectly free. Day by day, your grace empowering me to please you in all things, to walk in your ways, completely forgiven. If you're in Christ, which I haven't put the cup out yet, you are completely forgiven. And why is that? It's all by your grace. So would you just do this? Would you mind just standing? Okay, if you don't want to stand, you don't have to stand. If you want to, you can. But we're going to sing this song together and let the words really speak to you. And if you get so courageous... Just sing these as Steve leads Amen. us. As Frank was sharing that, your grace opens the way that I might draw near to you with my heart full of faith. Thought about the scripture we, we, at Lakeview have been going over Hebrews. And it's in the book of Hebrews, and they've been teaching on that. It says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, that means we're in Christ, uh, by a new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest, Jesus, over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in, sh in full assurance of faith. And that first line is so much talks about that, you know, that we might draw near to him with our hearts full of faith. Your grace opens the way that I might draw near to you. My heart full of faith, your grace is all undeserved. Though there are times I fail, though you are still with me, your amazing grace is perfectly free. Day by day, your grace empowering me. To please you in all things, to walk in your ways, completely forgiven, it's all by your grace. Your grace, your grace. It lightens my load. You give me the strength I need. Keep walking this road. Your grace is all that I need. Though I am weak, your grace is mighty within me your amazing grace is perfectly free day by day your grace empowering me to please you in all things to walk in your ways completely forgiven it's all by your grace to please you in all things 
walk in your ways completely forgiven it's all by your grace let's sing to the top of the chorus one more time your amazing grace is perfectly free Day by day, your oh, grace empowering me to please you in all things, to walk in your ways, completely forgiven. It's all by your grace. It's all by your grace. It's all by your grace. Amen. We just thank you, Lord, that it is all by your grace, Father. We pray this morning, Father, that you give us ears to hear, Lord, eyes to see, Lord, your word, Father, about the the, the great Holy Spirit that you caused to indwell within us and help us through our journey in life, God, through our the paths that we take each and every day, God. We live by the Holy Spirit, by Jesus. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Okay, you got to work off a little breakfast with that. Uh, well, welcome again. You know, as we've been talking about all these weeks, if the Bible is true, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is as well. And Jesus promised, therefore, of sending the Holy Spirit to us to live in us and with us and direct us and gift us and empower us is true. And he does this, three things. You may want to write this down on your, in your booklet. Just on the, on the blank page next to the, uh, on the front next to your notes. He gives us the ability to do three things, which is so important. One, to love God completely. This is what the Holy Spirit does. We cannot do this without the Holy Spirit. To love God completely. Then two, so important. Because we love God completely, we are capable by the Spirit's doing to love ourselves correctly. To love God completely gives us the ability to love ourselves correctly. And then thirdly, to love others compassionately. To love God completely is the means by which we love ourselves correctly. And if you and I have a problem with anything, it's loving ourselves correctly. People I know, like me, either love ourselves too much or too little. It's kind of like the three bears. Too hot, too cold. Very few of us are just right. But the more we know the God who loves us completely in spite of us, the more we love ourselves correctly in spite of us. And then love others compassionately in spite of them. <laughs> yeah. So I just find that when I'm driving on the road and somebody does something strange, I just wonder what kind of day are they having? Instead of going, what kind of idiot are you? <laughs> now that doesn't happen all the time. But I find that happening more and more. And I can't take credit for that. This is God taking me from that, which is comfortable. And to complain is comfortable. To thank is <laughs> growing less and less uncomfortable. And to pray for others. But this is all the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we're here, to learn more of Him. And if we have yet to, receive Christ. Get in the wheelbarrow. Say yes, say I do to Him. Um, and when we do that, as we've been, been discussing, our sin bill, our sin bill is forever, completely, forever forgiven. 
and we are forever completely accepted. That is God's work. So, as I said, we're going to be in the, in the booklet a good bit. And so, as, as we've discussed through Alpha, the, the most important and the most vital work of the Holy Spirit is to birth us into new life in Christ. It's the beginning. You can talk all you want to about uh, husband and wife talk all they want about having children and we want that child that child to be a, a an attorney or a doctor or a politician or a teacher whatever they want but unless you have a child you can talk all you want about how great that child of yours is going to be but unless there is a moment of conception and birth you're just talking smack. You had nothing to, to, to really deal with except something in your head. The Holy Spirit gives us life. Here's a starting point. I, I shared with you the analogy of Annette and me saying, okay, being at the altar, and Frank, do you take Annette to be your wife? Well, when I finally say, I do, at that moment, we are as married as we will ever be. Now, but we will grow through the years in knowing what it is to be married. We will grow through the years of knowing one another. And so when the Holy Spirit gives us life, that is the beginning of growth. It is the beginning of life. And when those 23 male chromosomes and those 23 female chromosomes get together, you have a 46 chromosome human being will be no more a human being scientifically at that moment of conception than when they're 70 years old. What's happened? Time, nutrition, learning, all those things. But every bit a human. And so when one receives Christ, they'll never ever be any more a child of God than they are at that moment of conception. You'll never be any more married than when the minister says, by the power invested in me, I pronounce you husband and wife. Totally married. And so the joy of that is knowing that God seals us by the Holy Spirit into him. And we can never be any more his. We will never be any less his. Just like your son or daughter will be any less your son or daughter. Or could be any more your son and daughter than the moment they are yours. And the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit is to birth us into Christ and then to grow us in Christ. So in your booklet, I've got here that Jesus said the Holy Spirit is God's real estate agent. Remember, we talked about that and that he shows us our real estate before God. And he, when he comes, he will convict the world. He'll convince us concerning Sin and righteousness and judgment. Um, I was talking to one of you guys recently and, and was asking the, I heard that were asking the question, well, how, how have you been affected by Alpha? This happens all the time. And the person, the, the person said, uh, you know, since I've been coming here, I've, I've never been more aware of all my failings. <laughs> it's like, well, I hope you don't need counseling or anything, but this... <laughs> This is, no, that's the work that God is doing. God is bringing those there, not to condemn, but to reveal in spite of all you've done, my grace, my unmerited favor to you. So if you find God doing that, we talked about that last week, that one of the ways in which you know God is working is that you're more aware of your tongue. You're more aware of your actions. You're more aware of your attitudes, the things you've even done in the past, the people maybe that you want to go to back and apologize to. I mean, this is the work of God's spirit. So he's the one that convinces us. And that's what Jesus says. Hey, when he comes, he's going to do the job of revealing to you the things you need to know. So that's what he's doing. That's the spirit, the invisible spirit of God working in you. And whether you ever thought about in the, that in your previous 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, doesn't matter. That's what God is doing supernaturally, invisibly in each and every one of us. No matter how smart we may think we are or how uneducated we may think we are, the spirit of God is no 
uh, what's the word? No. Respecter. What? Respecter. Respecter. Thank you. That word just completely left me. Respecter of persons. He meets us in each of us where we are. And then Romans, Paul writes, the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. I've, I, that, because I've had the joy of meeting so many people and hearing so many questions, I, these, I, hear, I, I read these scriptures and I just think of people that have, I've had this, and people want to say, well, how do I know? How do I know whether I've gotten in the wheelbarrow or not? Am, am I, how do I know? Well, here's the supernatural answer for you. Or yet that, that I haven't gotten in the wheelbarrow or not. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Or if I can add to the scripture and not damage it. Or are not children of God. We are in Adam or we are still in Adam, or we are in Christ. That's what the Spirit does. And then in your booklet, because uh, I'm, I'm going to have some scriptures up on the screen, and then some will be in your booklet. Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 1.30, I saw that 1 Corinthians 1.30a, that is not the highway that leads to all the affluent homes in Florida. Um, it is by his doing. Look at what Paul writes here. God's, he is God's, the Holy Spirit is God's real estate agent, God's initiator, activator. It is by his doing that you are in Christ Jesus. Okay? He is the one that leads us to Christ. You and I don't figure God out. He is the one that does this work through his cross and by his Spirit, it is by his doing that you are in Christ Jesus. I mean, the word activator is an interesting word. I just went and looked up the definition of this. A thing or person that activates. Thanks, that helps a lot. Um, <laughs> but this is what I loved. In chemistry, a substance used to induce or accelerate a chemical reaction. Okay, it, or it, it could be a bonding agent. I mean, with all the fillings I have in my mouth. Oh my Lord. Um, or a crowns that I have. Okay. I am, I am, my mouth could be king over many countries with all the crowns <laughs> in my teeth. Um, but there's a bonding agent that puts that crown right on there. There's a chemical reaction. And what happens is the Holy Spirit unbounds us or unbonds us or disbonds us, removes us. How about that word? That's a good word. Removes us from, from death and bonds us to Christ. Bonds us to Christ. And it's that quickly he does that. It may take me years, decades to get there. It took me a couple of decades to get there. But he got me there. And I'm so grateful that he did. But it's by his doing. He did that. And then Jesus says in, in John 6, that he is God's life giver. Look, it is the spirit who gives life. You don't give yourself life. Did you give yourself life when you were born? No, you didn't give yourself life. I didn't give myself life. You know, I didn't have a post-birth, you know, weird conversation, you know, ethereal conversation with my parents. I mean... <laughs> How strange is that? It is a spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. Do, do you get that? My natural being did not have anything to do. Where I was born, how smart I was, or how smart I wasn't, or any of those other things. The flesh has nothing to do with that. None of my religious works, none of my efforts to validate myself by my performance helped at all. It is the spirit who, what? Who gives. Again, we keep hearing this giving God. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Okay, these are supernatural things. They are not naturally discerned. You don't read them in a book and they make sense to you. You may read them in a book, but they're not going to make sense to you until the spirit makes those words have life. Okay, you see how subjective this sounds? But I can just tell you, after decades... Of experiencing more and more of the 
uncomfortable work of God and the revelatory work of God, things that make no sense to me, but I, they, they, make no, they make, make no sense to you, but I know that I know that I know this is what God is doing in me. That is a supernatural work of God. That is the work of the Spirit. It is God who does that. I wrote in your booklet here, Jesus is confirming in this statement of the Spirit gives life. That there is nothing anyone can do to make themselves acceptable to God and suitable for heaven. He mic drops with this statement. The flesh is of no help at all. Until you and I get to the point where, remember I told you about my friend that said, why wouldn't you? I laid out to him the gospel. Why would you not accept this free gift of abundant life in the dash, in the physical life, and then eternal life, abundant life forever, which we can't even begin to imagine forever on the other side of our last heartbeat. And remember the, the, remember the one word I, I shared with you that he said? Ego. That was it. I don't want to believe that my flesh and all of its successes, how many people, you know, kind of look up to me and expect me to do all these things. I can't believe that there's something that is beyond my ability to be attaboyed for or attagirled for. The f until I know this, until Frank Loria gets this, my flesh doesn't approve me before God. Until I let the Spirit of God seep down deep into me and I'm willing to put up the white flag and say, I surrender. I'll still be trying to figure this out. But hey, hey I would argue that's why you're here today. That's why you're here. I want to know this. You got better things to do on a Saturday morning. Other than breakfast. For, for, you know, but than to be here. And to experience this. And so what are the three things. Here's the most essential work of the Holy Spirit. For you and me at the bottom of page five. I think that is. He does three things. And I, and I attribute this to. One of our pastors at Lakeview, Peter Davidson, just a great alliteration here of what the Spirit does. He warns us, he woos us, and then he wins us. But he starts by warning us. Okay, you know, there are lots of warnings in life. I, I look for some, 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 uh, some warning labels, but, but this is what he does. He warns us about our true condition before God. He woos us to turn from our sins and our shame and turn to God, and then he wins us to accept the life of forgiveness and unconditional acceptance found in and offered only by Jesus Christ. Those are the three things that he does. He warns us of our condition in Adam. He woos us through his promises and through the signs of his love for us. And then he wins us by drawing us to accept him and trust in the work of his Holy Spirit. Okay? So first, he warns us. Now, you know, there's lots of warnings in life, aren't there? And the, and the, and the more attorneys there are, the more warnings we have to have, right? Because we, we just don't want to get find ourselves, you know. Well, maybe we do want to find ourselves on a Womack billboard, you know. You know, or, you know. <laughs> He got me $330,000. You know, it's like, that's why there need to be more warning labels. But there are warning labels all over the place. Here, here, here's a warning label, label. Remove child before folding. Now, why would you have to put that on a stroller? Uh, here, here's another one. Never use a lit match or open flame to check fuel level. I mean, I... Oops, I mean, well, well, but these are, uh, it was my favorite. Do not iron while wearing shirt. <laughs> now, okay, come on, let's come, let's come clean. Come on, I mean, been there, done that? Like, oh, I don't have any more hair on my chest. Okay, I don't have any more chest. Okay, that's right. <laughs> May irritate eyes. I mean, that's why you buy it, isn't it? That, that, by the way, that's, you know what that is, that's, that's okay. Um, my favorite, not intended for highway use. I mean, whenever I use my wheelbarrow, it's 
it's always on the highway. I mean, I have where I was. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> these are actual labels on these things. But here's one, a warning that unfortunately was not heeded. Uh, the crew aboard the SS Masaba tried to warn the RMS Titanic on April 15th, 1912, of the fact that they were heading into uh, an iceberg party. Um, but no one was in the communications room. And that message never made it to the bridge. And that warning went unheeded. And the result of it was death to lots of people. Um, can there be a more important warning than approaching death? I don't, I don't think so. And so the scripture tells us these things. And so the Lord lets us know and the Holy Spirit convicts us that these things are true. Again, and I, I just feel compelled to say this again. If Christ is raised from the dead, to me, it's like everything else falls into place. If he's not, this is just nonsense. Total nonsense. You know, just stop going to church. Stop wasting your time. Stop believing a fantasy, please. But since he is raised from the dead, we, the Spirit gives, his, gives the word to the first apostles, to those who wrote the scriptures, and we find out that without Christ we're dead. Again, separated from God in Adam in our trespasses and sin. We're just following the course of this world. We are running full speed away from God ready to jump off the cliff into an eternal hopelessness. We're following the prince of the power of the air. The prince of the power of the air is another word for the devil, for Satan. We're following his supernatural destructive path. The spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. According to the scripture, the spirit is at work in those who are still in Adam. So we're going to talk about this Tuesday night when we talk about how can I resist evil. We're going to talk more about what does the Bible have to say about evil? And how do I resist that? What, what do I have to do? How is God and how is evil and good working? And how do I overcome that? Okay. Without Christ, I'm living in the passions of my flesh. I'm just doing what I want when I want it and the hell with everybody else. I'm buying what I want. I'm selling what I want. I'm doing what I want. I'm getting in the way of who I want saying what I want. I'm living in the passions of myself and I'm carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And then by nature, by birth, I'm a child of the, a child of wrath. The scripture says I'm still in Adam. My sins are still on me. Instead of all the wrath that is due me being placed on Christ in my accepting that I am still under the weight of my sins, just like the rest of mankind who are in Adam. And so we've talked about these scriptures that confirm this. That was Ephesians chapter, Paul writing that to the church in Ephesus. Remember we talked about the wages of sin is death. Frank, Loria, you earned death. You, you show you're of Adam by the way you lived. Okay. That Frank Gloria, you sinned, you lied, you cheated, you lusted, you envied. And you are falling short of that which is acceptable to God. Can anybody deny they've done any of those things? I sure can't. I mean, the proof that I'm in Adam is, is seen through what I do and what I say, through my attitudes. There was ample evidence to show me the scripture is true. And then... Frank, you're not righteous. You can't stand before God. Not only cannot you, Frank, nobody can. None is righteous, not even one. And then, unless, Frank, you are born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus makes an amazing statement there. Unless you are born a second time, you're born first time physically to Buddy and Carol and Loria. You got to be born spiritually, Frank of the Holy Spirit, unless that happens, if Christ is raised from the dead, 
I will die with the wrath of God upon me. And I know that sounds so religious and so fire and brimstone-y. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I'm not making this up. Just read it for yourself. And because of this, we are separated from God, unacceptable to him. But here's the great news. He comes and woos us. Look, when a doctor tells you, you're going to die unless you take this medication. It's like, who the heck are you to tell me that I'm going to die, doctor? Why you come here with all that bad news? Why don't you get a little bit more positive in your life? I mean, would you tell a doctor that if he's like, hey, I got bad news. I mean, look at your, look at this PET scan here. Look at this CAT scan here. Look at this MRI. Look at your blood work. You need to do this. You know, you're not going to tear that up and just go, ah, let me go see another doctor. Let me go see somebody. Let me, matter of fact, let me go, let me just go see a comic. You know, let me go see a comedian. Uh, no, you're not going to, you're not going to do it. Well, God is telling you, I love you. And I, I got, I got bad news for you. But I got better news. I got good news. So not only does he warn us, he woos us. He's wooing us by revealing uh, to us who he really is. I mean, really, when you think about who isn't trying to woo us to buy something. Okay, have you done any kind of computer search recently for any one thing? And the next thing you know, everything on your screen. Is, sometimes I think it's just what I'm thinking about. It somehow makes it on the way of the screen. I, said, I don't think it should be called Google. I think it should be called Woogle because you just, you know, it's suddenly everything that I, you know, I just did one thing on a, oh, I'd like to find something, you know, about a drill. Pfft. Next thing my screen lights up corners, top, bottom. I can't see what I want to read because everything in there. And so it's just trying to woo us to buy that. And so that's what the Lord, the Lord tells us, that when the spirit of truth comes, he will woo you, he will guide you into all the truth. Okay, here's the great news. Who said he's the truth? Jesus. He will woo you to me. He will draw you. He will guide you to me. He said, this is the way to life. That's what he does. Okay, how else does he woo us? Here's what Paul said. This is a fascinating verse here in 2 Corinthians. Paul writing to those who are in Christ in the church in Corinth and the Greek for our sake. Okay, for Frank's sake, for Angela's sake, for Renee's sake, for David's sake. God made him Christ who was perfect, had no sin to take on all of our sin, to be sin for us. So that... Why did he do that? So that in him we might become the righteous. Don't pass this up here. Look at this. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Are you telling me? Is, excuse me. Am I supposed to understand this correctly? That God says when I'm placed into Adam, I become the righteousness of God in him? Yeah. See, if you're not the righteousness of God in Christ, Frank Loria, you are the unrighteousness of you in Adam. Okay? The only way I'm found to be righteous is in Christ. Not my righteousness. Christ's righteousness is imputed to me. And the perfection of Christ, the exception of Christ, this, the holiness of Christ is placed upon me by the work of God's spirit for our sake he did that that's some serious wooing now i don't know ladies what any man ever did to woo you to himself there ain't no wooing like this i mean this is a woohoo kind of wooing this is good news okay he died so i could have life and that life is when upon his ascension, he sends the spirit of God to give me life. He woos me. Again, in your booklet here, it's not in your, your notes. I mean, here, again, here's Jesus wooing. Come to me. Come to me. All you who are weary. I'll give you life. I'll give you rest. That's what he says. All you who are labored and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. 
Take your yoke upon, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle, lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He wants us to come to him so we can give him all the mess and all the hurt and all the emptiness and all the unforgiveness, all those things and experience his life. I wrote here, God initiated the rescue mission to redeem each of us to himself. And if not for this intervention, you and I would continue running to the edge of the cliff, finally jumping off into the arms of Satan's everlasting dominion of death. Now, if that, that doesn't get our attention, I don't know quite what will. You and I, if not for Christ's wooing us, continue running to the edge of the cliff of life, finally jumping off into the arms of Satan's everlasting dominion of death. Well then, it is his job to not only warn us, the spirit warns us, he woos us, but then <clears throat> for those who will, he wins us. He wins us. Now in your booklet, you've got here at the bottom of page, uh, page six, I wrote here, this is from Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus in Turkey. Um, chapter 2, he wins us to be born again in Christ. And we receive an experience, we ex receive an experience, as it is in your notes here, God being rich in mercy because of the great love which with, with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive, there it is, in Christ took us out of Adam, placed us into Christ, and that he raises, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now that's just a mind blower there. That somehow my spirit connected to Christ's spirit, I am one with him now in what, this, what Paul says are heavenly places and Christ is in me and on earth, which is anything but heavenly places. And then, he won us so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ. That is in the line when we are outside of our earth suits. Finally, he will reveal to us the immeasurable. You and I got no idea. Okay. Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, etc., etc. Paupers. Hoppers under the Claiborne overpass compared to the immeasurable riches. Those guys, me riches are measurable, but they're finite. The immeasurable riches of God. What, what could those be? I don't know, but I'm looking forward to finding out. I really am. So how does he win us? This is, what, this is what Paul says to Titus. I, one of my favorite verses ever. Okay. For those in Christ, he says, he saved us. Not, not because of works done by us in our own righteousness, but according to his own mercy. By the washing of regeneration. Okay. That's being born again, regenerated, born again. And the renewal he makes us new, the renewal, the new life given by the Holy Spirit. So again, <clears throat> whether you want to believe the scripture or not, this is what it says. You can't save yourself. The spirit gives life. The flesh profits nothing. It's by his doing. We are not saved because of any works done by us in righteousness, religious, right, uh, righteous works or just common everyday righteous works. According to the Bible, it can't happen. And so Jesus' work on the cross that is completed in our spirits when we receive him continues and progresses in our souls and is expressed through our bodies. <clears throat> so 
as Christ is dying, you may, you're probably aware of this if you've watched any passion movies. As Jesus is dying, before he dies, he says, it is finished. Okay? It is finished. Now, in the Greek, where that is, is how it's translated originally, it is the word tetelestai. It's actually an accounting word. And it basically, Jesus is saying, your bill is paid. You get up from the table, the bill's paid. Somebody paid your bill. They didn't pay for postage that was due. They paid, <laughs> he paid the total amount of all that we owe completely. It is finished. All that needs to be done for you and me to have a relationship with God and experience the immeasurable riches of his grace are when we receive the it is finished. Now, in a, in a few minutes, I want to give you, if you've yet to Get in the wheelbarrow, say, I do, receive the gift. And in a, in a few minutes, when I'm done here, I want to give you the opportunity to respond to this gift. To go from convinced, perhaps, to getting in, to saying, I do, Jesus. I trust that you said, I do to me. I want to say, I do to you. And it will be finished. And yet... Like I said, with marriage, I do is just the beginning. Okay? Being born is just the beginning. You're fully born. You're fully married. But there's more to come. More to come. Okay? And so, here's what Paul says to the church at Philippi. To those who are in Christ. I'm sure of this. That he who began a good work in you will complete it. Will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. At the very end, he will bring you to completion. But what did he do? He began the work. He birthed you. He married you. But he's still doing a work to bring it to completion. Okay? One more. Another verse in Philippians. Paul is saying, not that I've already obtained this, meaning perfection in, in his own body. Or am I already perfect? But I press on to make it my own. This maturity, this perfection, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I want to be more and more like him. Brothers, I don't consider myself as having, having made it, that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I want to grow in my marriage. I want to grow as a born again one. Okay? So Paul's saying, look, I'm not going to have a pity party and just soak in the past of all my failures. I was talking to a young man the other, the other night. He said to me, um, when I was talking to him about this very thing about receiving Christ, and I said, where are you with God? And he said, I believe God has forgiven me but I just can't forgive myself. I said, Whoa. I said, now think about this for a moment. How high do you think God's standards are of forgiveness? So are you telling me you have a higher standard of forgiveness than God does? You believe God has forgiven you, <laughs> but you can't forgive yourself? I'm trying to understand that. Yeah, the teacher passed me, but I think I should fail. <laughs> and, but then he realized, like the Apostle Paul, as much of a persecutor of the church as he was, that's who I was. That's not who I am. He realized that his past had been eradicated by the Spirit of God. And he'd been given a new life. Chapter, um, pardon me, session four. If anyone is in Christ, this is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If you want to go back to it, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old in Adam is gone. 
all things have become new. And this is what Paul is basically telling the Philippian church. Say, I press on to be, in my experience, more and more of who I already am. That's just really good news. Paul, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present yourselves as a living sacrifice. We're now alive. We present ourselves to God. God has made us, again, th these are crazy words if you think about it. God calls me holy and acceptable to him. That's my spiritual worship, to know him, to present myself to him. And Frank, don't be, don't continue to live like you lived when you were in Adam. Don't be conformed continually to this world, but be transformed by the renewal. There's that thing, the renewal of your mind that by testing, that by living in this world, that's what that means, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let me add here, not damaging scripture, as opposed to what you did in Adam, which was not good, not acceptable, and anything but perfect. Maybe perfectly wrong, but not perfect. So, now, if you will, turn to... Uh, Turn, if you will, for a moment. We're going to turn back in a second to page eight. And you'll see these little circles here, okay? Now, what I want to do here is just show us, just give us a picture here. Because a question that people, that so many of us have, I have myself, is, well, wait, if I'm in Christ and I'm as righteous as Christ, given Christ's righteousness, why do I continue to sin? Doesn't it seem like I would just... Just be Mr. Perfect, Miss Perfect now? Well, remember what, we, what I just, those three, I just had us look at three of many scriptures to show us that done, but there's also a being done, right? Totally born, totally married, and yet just beginning, okay? So I hope we're seeing that, and I don't want to trip over that. Okay, so let's just take a look at this, I hope. So we are, and theologians will debate about this, but I'm not a theologian, so they can debate all they want. Okay, the body, the Bible says, and then, then there's a soul part of us, and then there is the spirit part of us. Now I want us to just see that. So if you want to draw in your little circles here, so spirit in the middle, soul, body. Okay, our spirit relates to God. The soul, basically, which is, I'll put up here in a minute, our mind and our will and our emotions relate to others and ourselves, and the body relates to its environment, right? Like, it's always stinking cold in this room. My body, I hope, okay, my body experiences that, all right? So, so as I said, God, others, environment. Now, Apart from Christ, when I am in Adam, I am dead in my sins, spiritually separated from God. And I am, and my life is impacted by the world, everything on the outside, right? I just, I just see what's coming and I either respond to what's coming or I don't respond to what's coming. The world, right? Don't be conformed, Frank, any longer to the way the world thinks and what the world is telling you is right. Don't do that. Be transformed. And so, <clears throat> once in Christ, as I said, body, the, pardon me, the soul, mind, will, and emotions, the mind in which we think with, the will we choose with, the emotions that we feel with, we emote with, okay? And then here's the world. But when we're in Christ, we are beginning to be impacted by the Spirit from from inside from the inside of us that we now are alive in the spirit and God because we're joined to Christ bonded to Christ we have the spirit of Christ living in us he begins to be the one and you guys have already told me that you've experienced this there's a there's a change in your thinking there's a change in your choosing there's a change in your feelings all right and so the spirit works in changing our our, our, our motions and will and mind, and that affects our body and how we live. You've, that's what I'm talking about, the way we talk, the, fi the places we put ourselves, the places we don't put ourselves. And so we can say this, when Jesus says, it is finished, to tell us die, we have been saved. 
We have been made new in Christ. We have been placed into Christ. I can't be any more in Christ than I am now. Okay, if this is true, somebody could walk up to me right now. One of you could walk up to me, put a gun to my head, pull the trigger, blow my brains out. They'd have a hard time finding exactly where it is. But blow my brains out. And if they could hear me from the other side, they would hear me say, you missed. Because who you and I are is not ultimately or totally or foreverly body. But we are in Christ or not in Christ. Spirit, either to live forever with him or forever apart from him. So it's done. The I do is done. The birth is done. It's done. You can't fit any more into heaven than you do at this very moment if you're in Christ. And you can't fit into hell, according to the Bible, any more than you do right now if you're not in Christ. That's exactly where I was. And I was dumb as dirt and I didn't know it and I wouldn't have known it if God had not... Frank, wake up, you self-righteous twit. Now, he didn't say that, but that's exactly what I was. Certainly better than all of you people in this room. It's worse than I knew, really. And it's still worse than I, <laughs> that I know, but forgetting what's behind and pressing on. So it's finished. Okay. But in my soul, my mind, my will, emotion, it's being finished. The process continues. I mean, just think of it on a natural plane, whatever your profession is, okay? Whether it's dentistry or legal or music or whatever it may be, I guarantee you, you are better today than you were when you started your career, right, Jim? I, I hope so. Okay, yeah, yeah. Did, right? You're not, and so. But in the way we think, because of the Spirit of God working in, it's finished. I am being saved. The process is ongoing. But it's finished. And then in my body, well, my body's just going to have to wait. Okay? It will be finished. The Lord says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to put off this tent. And we're going to have a building, you know, whose maker is the Lord, eternal in the heaven. But the Bible just calls this a tent. Now, you know, how, how quickly would a tent be blown away in a storm, much less a hurricane? But we have a building, Paul says, eternal in the heavens. And so, again, I just want us to see this so we get a better sense of, yes, done. Yes, what's done will continue to be done. And yes, what was done and continues to be done will be finished when God says in his time. All right. So, uh, so here's the question as we close up in this morning session. Uh, where are you? Remember week two of Alpha? Um, the question was, where are you? Uh, are you curious? Are you convinced? Are you committed? Um, this is what I wrote on page seven of your, of your booklet. At the bottom of the page, where I said, this is the question. This is really, if, again, if the Bible's true, this is the question. There's really no other question. Where are you? I'm either in Christ or I'm in Adam. There is no middle ground according to Scripture. If in Adam, I am still in my sins, under God's common condemnation, separated from God now, and I will be forever, God does not want that for me. Can I just tell you? You would not be here. It's not, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I can't sell you anything. You'd not be watching if God wasn't He can't do any more, Frank Loria. 
than he has to prove it. He comes from heaven, folks. I mean, this, this is Christianity. He comes from heaven, eternally perfect, in total perfect fellowship with his Father. And he becomes like one of us. Now, he becomes like one of us. We don't get along with ourselves, much less so many others. He puts on flesh. He submits himself to his creation. He submitted himself to you and me, to people who would hate him, to people who would betray him. And he says, I love you that much that my reputation means nothing so that you can have a reputation before my father. He can't do any, what, what, what more could he do? He made the first move. But what will I decide? And I wrote here at the bottom, and to not decide is to decide. Do you understand that? To not decide is to decide. And so I'd like to do this. Um, again, this is, this is between you and God. It's got nothing to do with me. It's none of my business. And, and, and I hope and I pray and I, I trust you know that. I'm not here trying to sell you something. I'm not trying to get you to leave your denomination or leave your church. It has nothing to do with that. Please hear that. This has everything to do with you and the God who said, I love you so much. I left heaven to come and get you. And all that meant for the Son of God to be the Son of Man to submit himself to death, even death on a cross, naked before all those whom he came to die for. And even as he died there, as people spit on him and just railed on him and just uttered stuff you and I can't even imagine, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And what do I say today? Father, thank you that you forgave me. I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I did. So many people looked up to me. I got so much stuff. But I didn't know what I was doing. This morning, you can know what you're doing. And receive that forgiveness. And be given life like, you, like you've never had it before. Because I never had life until I had the one who is life. And so would you just do this with me for a moment? Just close your eyes if you would. Again, you don't have to. You don't have to do anything I'm saying. But you've been coming all these weeks. You've been debating with God. You didn't know you were debating with God. Felt like you were debating with yourself maybe, or maybe your table facilitator. Uh, but you've really been debating with God. The spirit gives life. The flesh profits nothing. And he's at this moment at this moment, it's about 1020. At this moment, hear God knocking at your heart. Will you let him in? We say I do. Would you receive? the gift that is Jesus Christ who is the one who is he doesn't just give us eternal life he gives him, him he gives us himself he is eternal life he gives us himself and he bonds us 
to him forever. Now, I just want to ask you to do this. If you've never opened the door to Jesus, just as a physical statement to yourself between you and God, would you just raise your hand just for a quick moment? This is for nobody else but you and God. But you're making a statement. You're making a statement like, yeah, come in and take over. Would you just raise your hand right now for a moment if you want to surrender to Christ? Okay. Would you just pray this with me? Lord, thank you for coming for me. Thank you for all the things that you had to do to have me watching, to have me here in this room. I realize now I didn't know what I was doing, but you knew what you were doing. And you knew what I needed you to do for me that I could never do for myself. Right now, at 10.20 a.m., October 5, 2024, I say I do to you. I do. I am yours. And you are mine. Thank you for coming for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for accepting me. Thank you for making me your boy, your girl. Thank you for life. Now, Lord, I'm looking for you and I'm trusting you to change me now as you have given me Christ in life. Now, Lord, I want that life to begin to not only ooze out of me, but to flow out of me. You said that for those who Come, came to you out of us would flow your life and so Lord in the midst of life at home and life on vacation or life at work or life around people I love and life around people I don't like at all flow out of me change me to look more and more like Jesus I want to forget what's behind. And you've promised that you've forgotten all that's behind. And I want to press on, just like the Apostle Paul and so many others. Lord, I am yours. I am yours. I declare that to myself and to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you, um, just because there's something really amazing and wonderful about, I use the word amazing a lot, um, something wonderful about confession. You know, we make a big deal about confessing sin, you know, particularly in certain denominations, you know, those of us who grew up Catholic, we made a, make a big deal about confession of what we did wrong. But there's something awesome about confessing what you did right. <laughs> okay? You buy a new car. What do you do? You, you put it in the, in the garage and hide it? No, not unless you stole it during Katrina, uh, which you didn't buy it then at all. Um, but what do you do? Ah, I want to show you. I just want to encourage you to, to make that confession. You here today without a wife or a husband or family or whatever, and just say, let me tell you what happened to me on October 5th. Let me tell you what happened to me this morning at 10:20 a.m. I was born. <laughs> I was born again. I was Christ. I accepted what Christ did for me. <sighs> All right, before we take a break. Uh, 
turn to page uh, 10, if you will. This is kind of fun. Um, but at the same time, I, I think there's value to this. If you receive Christ today, or whenever you may have during the course of this Alpha or before, and you want to just sign this declaration of dependence. You know, many years ago, our forefathers signed the Declaration of Independence from England. Well, this is a declaration of dependence on God. And you would just simply, on this day, I make this declaration of dependence upon Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and only means of salvation. I make this declaration confident that apart from Christ, I am dead in my sins because I am in Adam. And that the only life and work that will rescue me from eternal separation from God is that of Jesus' life and work alone. He alone is my means of overcoming joy in this life, in relationship with him in the dash, and eternal joy with him forever in the next in the line. I do. I receive the gift. I'm in the wheelbarrow. I turn away from my old life. I am Christ's. And he is mine. Thank you, my God, and now my Father, for saving me. And I just encourage you, sign it. And then get a couple of witnesses. It may sound strange, and it is. But it's good. It's good. So we're going to do this. Um, just take a quick break. But I want us to get around the tables, you know, back at your tables and discuss this morning's session and just what God did in you through this session uh, and what God is continuing to do. And then we're going to uh, spend some time getting into the story of the prodigal son. And then we'll break. We're, we're, we're really ahead of schedule, um, but there's nothing wrong with that. So... Um, could we do this before we take a break? Could, 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 could we? Oh. <laughs> All right, I shouldn't have done this. Um, could we just do this real quick? Could I just get your attention just for a moment? Um, I, I wanted to. Um, I wanted to ask Steve just to, um, to to lead us in that song, Steve, that we sang at the beginning of the morning. And just stay seated where you are. Let this be, okay? And, and don't so much worry about looking up at the words. Okay, what just happened here in many of your lives is so solemn and so wonderful. I, I just don't want us to jump up immediately and just go to something else. This is too good. This is just too good to just jump up and do something different. So... Let's just try it for a moment just to be still. And uh, I'm going to get the computer to, to, uh, to get us back where I'd like us to be here. So just continue to be with the Lord in your, in your heart and what's taken place. And then just sing this in your heart, with your mouth. Maybe if you've prayed this prayer for the first time, you're singing this as a different person right now. So let's do that, Steve. Your grace, it opens the way that I might draw near to you. With a heart full of faith Your grace Is all undeserved Though there are times I fail Still so you are still with me You're amazing is perfectly free day by day your 
your grace empowering me. Lord, to please you in all things, to walk in your ways, completely forgiven. It's all by your grace. It's all by your grace. Your grace. Your grace. It lightens my load. You give me the strength I need to keep walking this road. Your grace is all that I need. Though I am weak, your grace is mighty within me. Your amazing grace is perfectly free. Day by day, your grace is empowering me to please you in all things, to walk in your ways, completely forgiven. It's all by your grace to please you, please you in all things, to walk in your ways, completely forgiven, it's all by your grace, it's all by your grace, it's all by your grace. I want us to do just one more thing. Um, I get that I'm doing this because we have time, um, but I'm not. I'm not w just trying to use up time. I, I really want what God has done to sink deeply in. If, if you've got your Alpha Bible, or if you've, I want us to turn to Psalm 23. Now, if there's anything anybody may know in the Old Testament. It's Psalm 23. Uh, if you've been to a funeral, you've probably heard Psalm 23. Uh, I think it's unfortunate. Paige, thank you, sweetheart. 506. It's kind of a picture. There's a picture of, of salvation. The work of God and the that is complete and the work that continues through us. Now, if you'll give me a little license here, you know, one of the greatest ways to pray is to pray scripture back to God. Psalm 23. I'm going to make this a prayer, but I want you to, to follow the words in the scripture, but also as I pray this. And this is what you can pray this morning. If you are now in Christ, the Lord is your shepherd. He is your shepherd. You are his responsibility. And he's glad to have you. Lord, you are my shepherd. I'm not my shepherd anymore. Satan's not my shepherd. The world is not my shepherd. My reputation is not my shepherd. Where I live is not my shepherd. What I can do is not my shepherd. You are my shepherd. I shall not want. Lord, you make me lie down in green pastures. Lord, you, you give me places of rest. You lead me beside deep, still, peaceful waters. It is you who restore my mind, my will, my emotions, my soul. You, Lord, are the one who has led me in this path of righteousness. And you did that 
for your namesake and that I could bear your name. I am God's boy. I am God's girl. That's my dad. God who created all things. You are my father. And even though, Lord, in this world, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, death is no longer on me. I will put off this body, but I will be with you forever. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me, they correct me, they protect me, they provide for me. Lord, your rod and your staff, you are for me. You're no longer, you're not against me, you're for me. And Lord, you prepare a table before me, even in the presence of my enemies. Lord, you anoint my head with oil. Lord, I don't know what I got on this earth, but what I got in you is measureless. My cup overflows. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, meekness, kindness, self-control. Surely, goodness and mercy. Surely, Lord, you who are good and you who are merciful, follow me. You go before me. You go behind me. You go around me. You're above me. You're below me all the days of my life. And then... When I breathe my last, I'll dwell with you forever. Thank you. Oh God, may we know this beyond the words that you had written. May these words be written in our hearts, in our minds, that they would ooze and flow out of us declaring how grateful we are for new life in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.